Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom Kudato Live for February the 21st, this Saturday show. Today's topic is our featured teacher for February, and she's Mary Beth Hertz. She's our special guest today. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, and Tammy Moore. Thanks so much to Tammy for doing the closed captioning. I'm going to turn the um, talking over to Maureen, who will introduce Mary Beth and ask the um, newbie question on the next slide. Great. Thanks, Lori. I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce Mary Beth Hertz to you. If you don't know her, she is an incredible educator. She's worked in elementary and high school. I first met Mary Beth probably in 2009 or 10, it was a while back. I was reading her blog, Philly Teacher, and met her on Twitter. I met her in, at ISTE or NEC in Washington, D.C., and at ISTE in the uh, years after that, and only knew her virtually most of the time until I met her at Educon, I think it was in 2009 or 10 and got to sit and talk with her. She's an incredibly dedicated, hardworking young teacher. And in 2010 and 11, when we were both working in different um, elementary school computer labs, we got to collaborate on a couple of holiday tradition voice threads. My kids were amazed to hear the voices of the kids from North Philly. It was a different world for them. Today, Mary Beth Hertz teaches high school students technology and art and is the tech coordinator at the Science Leadership Academy at Bieber in Philly, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is the new SLA. She's also an EdCamp Foundation board member and a Philly EdTech ed Meetup co-organizer co and as you heard, a new mom to Noah. Mary Beth began teaching in Philadelphia in 2004 as a science teacher in grades K through 6, and then spent eight years in K through 8 as a technology teacher. She was named an emerging, lead, emerging leader by ISTE in 2010, a PAECT Teacher of the Year in 2013, and an ASCD emerging leader in 2014. I take issue with the emerging leader. She has emerged. She is a wonderful leader in education and technology. Mary Beth blogs for edutopia.org and at mbteach.com and can be found on Twitter as mbteach. So I hope that Mary Beth is back from Noah. Noah is trying to be uh, take a nap. I'm not quite sure if she's back yet or not. And we can move on and ask her the newbie question if she's ready. I'm here. Oh, good. OK. So the newbie question for you as the featured teacher is, what does Web 2.0 mean to you? And why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? So take it away, Mary Beth. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I know we have people from different time zones. Um, but uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, and I do apologize. I have a seven-month-old. I'm home alone with him. And so um, anyone who's ever had a seven-month-old knows that uh, it may not be very, it's not very easy. So if you hear me, uh, if you hear me talking to him, I apologize. Um, but yeah, so as far as Web 2.0 goes, um, I was thinking about this question when you guys sent me, um, you sent me the, the question. And you know, I realized I haven't used the term Web 2.0 in a really long time. Um, when I first really got into this stuff, I guess that was um, 2009, 2010, um, Web 2.0 2 was like the new thing, you know, the interactive web was what people um, referred to it as, you know, the, the fact that, you know, you could interact with websites, build things, create things. And I think that um, nowadays, Web 2.0 is the web. 
Um, I don't really think of the internet as having an, a non-interactive aspect to it anymore. Um, so, you know, when I when my kids use the internet, um, you know, even just thinking about the you know, we use Chromebooks, so the extensions that they might install allow um, add interactivity to their browser even. Um, and so I guess um, oh, you just knocked my headphone out. Sorry, hold on. <laughs> um, and so I guess you know, for me. Um, yeah, well, Web 2.0 is more just it's, that's the web. Um, so maybe you know we're thinking about what Web 3.0 might look like. Um, and uh, and as far as why I use you know interactive tools in the classroom, um, I mean basically you know as a project-based high school and as the project-based teacher that I've been for um, many years, my my goal is for kids not to just consume the web but to use it to create new things. And so. Um, and so for me, the web two point web two point tools, meaning for me, just the web in general, is a a, a creation tool. Um, uh, you know, you use it to get information, but then what are you going to do with that information? And so um, that's kind of that's kind of my immediate thoughts on the question. Great. Oh, let me turn off my mic. Sorry. No, you're fine. You can move on and do your slides now. We're really looking forward to it. Thanks, Maybeth. Sure. Um, so I've got him in my arms. I may move him. Um, so for now, we'll see if he pulls. He's pulling my mic out. Oh, I think I need to do that. Sorry. <laughs> um, so basically, this is an overview of what we're going to um, talk about, and uh, we're going to. I want to take you guys. Hold on. I want to take you guys on a little tour of my classroom. And when I say my classroom, it's not just going to be um, the classroom that I'm in now, but I figured it might be neat because I just transitioned to high school last year. And before that, I was in elementary, K to 8, which, you know, 8 isn't necessarily elementary. Um, but uh, it's not necessarily elementary, but it, I, I was in a K to 8 school. So, um, and then just kind of comparing my experiences with elementary and high school and kind of reflecting on that. And then obviously we do some, some Q&A. Um, so I have basically my slides are mostly pictures. So I don't really have a lot of text on them. I'm going to basically just talk you through the pictures. Um, and so this is not my very first computer lab. Um, I started teaching in a computer lab in 2000, I'm going to remember this. Uh, 2007, I think, and it was a different, um, still Max, uh, but a different computer uh, setup. And um, so this was my second school that I worked at, and so this was my lab. Um, I didn't really have a choice of how it was set up because of the room, and so it was. Uh, if anybody's ever taught or used a computer lab, um, you can imagine kids sitting in the room. There's actually a whole other side, so there were two sides with a, a kind of. Um, uh, path down the middle, and uh, you know, if I was in the front right hand corner of the room and a kid needed help in the back left corner of the room, it was like weaving through all of these computers and behind kids to get to that kid. Um, and that's yes, as well as Alliance Marine. So, actually, we made our um, Marine and I did a project together where our kids created, um, and we did a um, oh, my brain is just a voice thread. Um, where our kids actually did holiday pictures and uh, talked with each other. And so yes, text paint and voice thread. And so um, this was the lab that the kids used to create the, uh, the drawings so, and um, record their voices. Um, and uh, so basically, um, when I'm talking about what I did in the computer lab, um, this essentially is kind of the setup that I was working with. Um, I mean, as you see, those are really nice computers. I was very lucky to have um, those. Um, and as far as headsets go, um, I, uh, I actually did a Donors Choose project to get headsets for my classroom. Right now, this was actually the very beginning of the year. And I don't know if you see, there are Bluetooth keyboards and mice. Um, I was not in charge of the ordering of this. In fact, I. Um, I think I, the IT people, the company we hired out, um, I said, you know, this is what I want. And they went ahead and ordered the Bluetooth uh, mice and keyboards. And what was really fun was in the beginning of the year, 
I could hit the front of the room control, I could hit the computer at the back of the room because we hadn't set up the Bluetooth correctly. And so kids were dropping and, and picking up um, and picking up each other's signals all over the room and it was just maddening. Um, we did figure out the problem and we just fixed it. Uh, but the other piece is, you know, who in their right mind has wireless keyboards and mouse mice in a school? Because you can't, you know, they're not, they can easily just disappear or, um, you know, go missing. Luckily, um, I'm pretty OCD, and so I actually, you know, all my kids at the end of the of the lab, you had to push your keyboard and mouse back. I had um, every single keyboard and mouse was labeled with a number. The computers were labeled with a number so that you knew which mouse went to which keyboard, which went to which computer, and so on and so forth. Uh, keyboards also easily get, even by accident, pushed to the ground. And so we would have kids, you know, with their elbow, like knock a mouse, um, uh, knock a mouse off the table. Sound dropped. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so I don't know if uh, what you heard, but basically I just said that. You know, sometimes it's like we get knocked off the table because um, of a, you know we have little third graders and there, second graders and there they got busy bodies, um, and so if uh, if the sound drops out, yeah, just let me know. Um, I'm sorry about that. So um, I actually don't use I use Apple Remote um, Apple Remote Desktop. That was what um, I used in the district. This is a charter school that I was at, and then I was in the district for five years before. Um, long story, but. Uh, the, I used Apple Remote Desktop, which was awesome. Um, but uh, in this lab, I actually didn't use anything. And I actually don't use, I tend not to use any of that software. Um, the biggest thing I used it for was to broadcast my screen onto their screen so that they could see what I was doing. So like if I was doing a tutorial to show them how to do something, it would be right in front of them rather than um, really far away on the board. And actually, you see, if you see in the back, that was my Promethean board in the back of the room. This was before the lab was fully set up. So you can see that um, the Promethean board hadn't even been um, hung yet. So um, Apple Remote Desktop is essentially, I mean, you can take control of the kid's computer. You can send kids private like messages that pop up on their individual screen. You can uh, record their screen. You can take pictures of what they're doing on their screen, which came in handy because I had kids who um, you know, were doing things they weren't supposed to. And it's very easy without them knowing for me to just kind of take a picture of uh, of their screen, and then uh, you know, it was easy to like email it to somebody or, or send it to somebody. Um, but I don't, uh, and then you could also lock the screens so that if a kid, like I worked at a school, my very first school was very rough, um, and so I literally had classes where I would just lock all of their screens, and as kids settle down, just unlock them one at a time. Um, and so, um, and so that was, you know, a good classroom management, I guess, tool. But um, but as I and that was that was in the beginning of my time at the computer lab. But now I don't really use and I stopped using it for that kind of classroom management. Um, and I really just used it to um, kind of facilitate the learning that was going on. So that's my computer lab at the charter school. Um, and in that computer lab, I during those three years, I developed my own curriculum based around these four, I call them pillars. I've done a couple blog posts about them. Um, and so to me, these are the four main things that communicate, evaluate, collaborate, create. And you can see that there were little, those are examples of things that we would do in the classroom that would tie into those, um, those four pillars. And so those these classroom um, in my computer lab. Um, and so for me, it was there's not really a, a set. It's really hard to find like a computer lab curriculum that's not awful. Like just you know, here's some typing, make a PowerPoint, like do you know, just really, really awful. And so um, and so I felt like okay, I need some kind of like overarching guide, and so the, the pillars helped me kind of guide the direction of where my teaching was going to go, and um, kind of put it in buckets. And so, um, and so then, um, alongside with that, I had a, a scope and sequence, and so I spent some time thinking about okay, what does this look like in kindergarten? What does this look like in first grade? 
second grade, third grade, I did all the way up to eighth grade. And so my curriculum, that it was based around these four pillars. Um, so everything we did was could be put in one of those buckets. But then in addition, I had units. And so these were the units that I had. So I had online safety, digital citizenship, programming, digital storytelling, office tools, and research. So those were my main uh, my main curricu uh, units. And then the last column was just kind of like, you know, I, to me, there's, there's certain skills you have to know, but there, it's not like a unit. You're not going to spend an entire, entire unit on mouse control, right? And so for me, it was while I was teaching the units, I was making sure to address um, the, the basic technology skills and operations, um, you know, as kind of like the, they call it like the hidden curriculum, like what was kind of going on in the background. Um, and so um, I taught online safety to K through two, or maybe it was K through three. And then once the kids got older, I, it transitioned into more of a digital citizenship because um, in the younger grades, they're not, um, they're doing less engaging with each other and more just engaging with the technology. So it's more about how do I protect my private information, how do I, um, how do I make sure that I, I don't put myself in a, in a bad position online. And then as I get older, it's more about not only the safety, but then how do I be a good person when I'm communicating with other people online. Um, and then for the programming, I mean, literally in kindergarten, it was um, more about, it was really just about um, the thinking the, the logical thinking um, and kind of what programming was, whereas, you know, once you got into first, I think second grade, I started with Scratch. And so second through eighth grade, um, we used Scratch. And so if you're not familiar with Scratch, I forgot to put that in the links, Peggy, I'm sorry. Um, but scratch.mit.edu, um, uh, that, is, um, that is a really awesome way to get kids kind of thinking about um, programming. So um, I think people are pretty familiar with digital storytelling. Um, a lot of people do digital storytelling in their classrooms. Um, and office tools, I couldn't escape it. Um, you know, the kids just need to know how to, um, how to format, how to save files, open files, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, um, and then research is really one of the hardest things I have ever taught um, because it's research on the internet, I mean, you know, if you look something up, it's like you get a bunch of crap. And so how do you tell kids to do, you know, how it rivals as the, the crap detection? You know, how do you get kids to know what's crap and what's not? And especially when they have very little, if their reading skills are subpar, they tend to just kind of copy paste or they don't take the time to like analyze what they're reading. And so research is really, really hard. Um, and so I can't say that I ever you know, perfected that process, but um, yeah, citations are a whole other, <laughs> a whole other beast. I did use EasyBib, um, which did help, um, but it also doesn't teach them like what citations are. It just kind of makes the process easier. And so, um, you know, for the the research with the, I mean, I did research with first graders and second graders. And so what I did was I used um, Symbaloo. And I'm just, because I'm a terrible person, I forgot to put these things into the, uh, I forgot to put these things into the um, stuff, the links, Peggy. Um, Symbaloo, I created like a, a page for each grade in Symbaloo, and then the kids, the younger kids could just click to get to the resources that I had already gathered for them. And so they just like, like for instance, second graders did, um, they did, uh, what do you call it? Um, I'm sorry, the animals. And so I just made different tiles with different animals and they would choose an animal and then I had already found a website that was good information. So it kind of helped them with that process. Um, so that's my, that was my curriculum for my computer lab. Um, it, it was totally a work in progress. It was never, you know, it's just we're constantly evolving, constantly changing. Um, and so it's, you know, I, I kind of have let it drop because I'm, um, and you'll see why in a little bit. But it was a really awesome process to really think deeply about what I wanted kids to know, when I wanted them to know it, and then how to scaffold that learning um, throughout the year. Um, and so one of the ways I used um, to teach digital citizenship, um, and unfortunately it looks like you have to pay for it now, but um, I found the Infinite Learning Lab videos for online safety and cyberbullying to be really, really awesome 
because um, there were fun. There was Garfield. The kids love Garfield. Um, and then the um, there's a, a, a acronym called Yappy. Um, and I don't think it showed up on here because I think I forgot to change the text to, to white. <laughs> um, but Yappy was your, you, you don't share your Yappy. It was your name, your address, your password, um, your phone number, and your plans. And so the kids really were able to easily memorize that. And so it was a really nice, um, really good for elementary age kids. Um, so this is my first computer lab. So they, I also had IMAX, the very first uh, uh, standalone IMAX. Well, not that was not the very first. Very first flat screen because I had the bubble ones too. Um, and so my original lab was a bunch of tables and desks with daisy chained power strips. Um, and if the kid kicked under the table, they could actually kick the power strip, and like 12 computers would just go off, like shut down. So it was pretty jerry rigged. Um, but this is an example of like in. I also tried to incorporate what the kids were doing in their classrooms. So, um, for instance, second graders, and these are actually not second graders in the picture, but that's the second grade um, work. The, um, the second graders were learning about the cycle, life cycles and learning about plants and plant structures and things like that. And so they used um, Tux Paint to create a diagram of a plant. And then I was in third grade. It was third grade, not second grade. Um, and so the, it was awesome, you know, like they were learning in the classroom, they could come to the lab and they would be able to apply what they were learning in the lab. We did actually, I sent them on some websites, they did some research on the different parts of the plant. Um, but the only problem is that when you see kids once a week for 45 minutes or twice a week for 45 minutes, by the time they finish the project, um, collaborate with the classroom teachers, was that they just didn't see me enough to make it worthwhile. And we didn't have the setup where, not worthwhile, it was always worthwhile, but just to make it really meaningful. Um, and we didn't have it set up. I know some schools have it set up where like the teacher comes, isn't a prep for the teacher, the teacher comes in and they um, actually go through the, you know, work with the computer lab teacher and it's not a break for the teacher. We did not have that set up. My classroom was considered a prep for the, my class was considered a prep for the teacher. Um, so then at the charter school, in the third year I was there, um, we wrote a grant and we got, um, I think it was 27 netbooks. Um, and so the, um, the netbooks were awesome. This was my very first experience teaching with uh, the kids not sitting in rows. And it was like the most amazing experience ever. <laughs> because the kids could just, it was just, I could just easily get to the kids. The kids were, um, it just felt natural than learning rather than this like in rows kind of thing. Um, if you see on the left hand side, it's a little dark, but that was the cart and those are first graders getting their own machines out of the cart. And so I actually trained them on how, you know, they all had a number and they knew their number and their number was alphabetical. And so it was easy on my roll sheet to know kind of who's what number. Um, and then um, I had one kid stand at the cart and call the numbers, and then the other kid whose number it was would come up. We practiced holding with two hands. We practiced walking to our tables, not running. Um, and then, um, and I, so I did that with all of my classes. So I did that with, um, well, kindergarten, we didn't do it right away. We did it probably like halfway through the year. Mm -hmm. but, um, but then first through, uh, the netbooks were used with first, second, and third grade. And so um, they were able to do it themselves. Um, they were, you know, I think we don't trust kids sometimes to do these kind of things. And you know, the teachers will look at me like you're crazy. But they, I've, I never had one drop um, ever. The kids were pretty good with it. Um, and then the uh, the other piece, to, and I saw somebody put um, something in there in the the. Um, so, yeah, so the assessment was a big piece. I'm glad somebody brought that up. So I actually piloted standards-based report cards in my um, in my classroom. I did not believe that my class really like fit into the A, B, C, D kind of realm because I wasn't giving tests, I wasn't giving assessments. I was completely project-based, um, and I wasn't assessing necessarily specific skills. Um, I was, but not like in a testable, quantifiable way. I used active grade to create my standards, and so the kids got a separate grade from me, um, a separate report card from me that would show like 
these are the skills your kids should know how to do by the end of the quarter, and like this is where they are towards that. So you know, if you look at if you look at that other screen we were looking at with the the scope and sequence, that's how I would use that scope and sequence to decide which skills um, the kids should know by when. And as far as media specialists, I've never worked in a school with a media specialist. I've never worked in a school with a functioning library. Um, Philadelphia, most of Philadelphia schools do not have functioning libraries. Um, and usually only high schools really do. Um, and so, yeah, I've never ever had a chance to work with anybody else, um, unfortunately. I have lived in, on an island. Um, and so, um, so, yeah, so, you know, this was a really nice transition for me. And I think that this experience, and actually you can see the donors choose headphones. Um, that was the other piece. I had like a, a container, like a big, a, like a big, um, with a, what do you call it, like a, not a tub, but a, kind of like a, like a fishing kit, you know, with a handle full of headphones. And then I had a kid stand with an Apple cart and a kid stand with the headphones and the kids would go get their, to get everything. Um, but actually, I think in my third grade class, I got it down to five minutes where every kid could have their netbook and be ready to go in five minutes. Um, and I would time them, actually. I would time them, and I would, you know, we would make it like a fun game. Like, how long is it going to take? And I'd turn on my timer on my phone, and, and I'd say, look, guys, you did it in such and such. And sometimes I would make them compete with each other. So, like, well, so and so's class did it in this much time, but you can meet it, or you can beat it. Um, so, um, let me see. Um, and then so now, you know, I'm teaching high school. I've been teaching high school since last year. I'm, um, I was one of the founding staff members of um, the Science Leadership, Leadership Academy at Beaver. And so if anyone's familiar with the Science Leadership Academy, the, it is a, um, a project-based, inquiry-based high school. Um, every student has a um, every student has a, a Chromebook um, in the, the and then Basically, there's two campuses. There's an original campus that's been around for about eight years. And then last year, they opened up a second campus, and that's where I work. And so we have only Chromebooks. They have a mixture of MacBooks and Chromebooks. They're phasing out the MacBooks. Um, so essentially, you know, if this project-based inquiry-driven high school, the, um, everything is based around understanding by design. And so everything you do is based on essential questions and during understandings and really looking at the big picture and working backwards. And so it really worked out, you know, the transition from what I was doing in the lab really worked out when I was going into high school because I was doing the same thing in my computer lab. I just kind of didn't know it. You know, I was looking at those four pillars, like where do I want my kids to be, and then setting up my lessons to guide them in that direction. Um, and so this is the syllabus um, for my ninth grade intro to tech class. Um, so we have grade-wide essential questions throughout the school, and so those are the ninth grade essential questions. And then those are my unit essential questions. The unit is two quarters long. Um, every single um, every single uh, ninth grader gets my class. It's like a required class that they go through before um, before they you know as they first really start um, their their high school career with us. And since every kid has a laptop, you know I really really focus on those two learning goals that that deeper understanding of how they act online, who they are online, and the choices they make online. And then also um, the idea that you know, I'm, this class should prepare them to be successful using technology at SLA. Um, and so um, I, uh, yeah, so what, you know, basically we, we, dis we do a lot of discussion. And one of the things that we discuss, we, we read this book called LOL ONG together. And I have to give a hat tip to um, Marcy Hull, who has basically founded the tech program at um, SLA and uh, the original campus. And so she gave me this, um, this she said, you got to read this with your kids. And so we literally read it. So I read to them um, chapter by chapter. And um, it's basically it's written by the gossip website and saw just the horrible things that were going on, write a book about online, the importance of protecting your just about the importance of your um, decisions and choices that you make when you're using the internet and social media. Hopefully, Mary Beth will be right back with us. Obviously, she lost her connection. Uh, 
um, and because her voice was cutting out, I had a feeling that was coming. So be patient, and she'll be back just as quickly as she can get logged back in. Anyone would like to take the mic to share your experience, either with computer labs or any of these things, feel free to raise your hand and we'll give you the mic. Great, Paula. I'm giving you the microphone, and you can click on back. All right, finally got it. Okay, so um, just a couple of things I was wondering about when we get Mary Beth back. Um, being a computer lab teacher, I think is very challenging in most school settings um, if there is not a design curriculum for them to use. Um, in our computer lab, um, unfortunately, it has gone to a situation where um, the teachers take the students to the lab once a week for a 45 minute period, and that is where they do um, testing, <laughs> unfortunately on things like um, iReady or Lexia or something like that. Um, unfortunately, there are no, quote, lessons taught within our computer lab, which I think is really sad. I know we keep discussing it because we need um, somewhere for the kids to do some keyboarding skills, and that's not being done. So I was wondering how Mary Beth deals with that. You know, what? Is that a part of the curriculum she's using, or do they just not worry about keyboarding skills and they just keep going? And how, how do we get where we can have a better mix of you know, using the computer lab as a testing room versus a learning room? Well, uh, Paula, this is Maureen. I I'm working as a tech coach now. I used to be in a computer lab. And there's a need for both kinds of places, a computer lab with real curriculum and a place where the kids can actually use cards or have computers in their rooms that are actually part of their curriculum, their social studies, their science and having things being taught in context. And what I find works well for me is, ha is doing projects with the teachers. For example, fourth grade is doing a project on immigration, and we're using Glogster to do our posters. And so they, they're getting to use Google Docs for typing and research. Blogsters for multimedia, etc. And I know Mary Beth is back, so I'm going to get off. Sorry about that, guys. My internet just crapped out on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, what was I going to say? More? I'm actually it sounded like you guys were having a pretty awesome conversation about mm -hmm. some cool tools. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I guess um, you know, my biggest difference for teaching um, high school is, and I, and I use that picture on the right-hand side, I mean, that's a typical day, that's like during the school day, typical day at our, at our school. You know, if, kids, if a kid's got a computer, a lot of times, you know, they're, they're just hanging out working on projects, and so they're not, and it's not like, you know, a teach, like, you know, we talked about that, like, software used to look at each kid's computer and everything like that. You know, we're not doing that. Um, in fact, you know, a lot of people use Chromebooks, and, and you know, we have we do have the admin console because we're Google Apps for Education, but we do not enroll our devices into our Google Apps. We don't actually track what kids are doing. We don't lock down apps. We don't block things from kids from kids being able to put stuff on their device. We treat the, the we give the kid the device. If we're going to expect the kid to treat the device as if it's their own, then we need to let them use it as as if it's their own. 
And whenever you try to lock something down, a kids are going to spend their efforts, they're going to spend their time and effort trying to figure out how to get around it. And so for us, it just didn't seem worth our time. Um, and it didn't go along with what our goals were um, to really put a lot of controls on these machines. Um, and so far, you know, the great thing about Chromebooks is um, you can't really screw them up. It's not like a Windows machine or a Mac where you can really mess with, um, you know, mess with the actual inner workings of the computer. I mean, the Chrome OS, literally, if, if something goes wrong with the OS, there's a recovery tool. You pop a thumb drive in there, and boom, you've got a new operating system on there. And the kids don't lose anything because it's all on their Google Drive. And that's one thing we talk about in the beginning of the year when we talk about acceptable use policy is that you know, the school will not be responsible for lost files. You need to back up your stuff into your drive or Dropbox or something like that because um, you know, that's your responsibility as a student. And so, um, you know, and so it's really important that, we have these, that I have these conversations with kids. Um, and we actually don't give the machines to the freshmen until October. So the whole first month of the year, it's really you where know, we, we start reading the book, we go over the accessible use policies, so that when they get their machine, they already know um, we already know what the rules are. And then I also do an activity where we talk about um, rights and responsibilities, and they create a chart of the rights and responsibilities of digital citizens, and we talk about what a digital citizen is and um, and what it means to be one. And so, you know, they begin to see that, you know, for every right that you have is a responsibility. So yeah, you have the right to post things on YouTube, but you have the responsibility to do it legally and respectfully and, you know, those kinds of things. And so, you know, we do that on paper because they don't have their machines yet. We do it on chart paper. Um, and then we ha and then I hang them up outside my room. So as the kids walk down the hallways, you know, the hope is that they'll be like, oh yeah, and like be reminded of, of what we talked about. And what's been really great, like just, just yesterday, I had two students, I came in, you know, class was starting, and the two students obviously were in an argument. So I pulled one student out and talked to them um, and found out there's something happened at lunch and someone took somebody's stuff, you know, one of those typical, like, really immature high school drama things. Um, and that then, you know, it came out that the kid, one of the kids had texted the other kid, hey, do you want to fight? And that's what kind of spurred the, the argument. And so, yeah, it totally sounds like elementary. They're not much better. <laughs> um, and so the, um, then I you know, pulled the other kid out, the kid who had sent the text, and I said, um, you know, because uh, you know, he said, well, I, I, I didn't want to say anything to her or talk to her because I knew that we would get into a fight. And I said, well, you kind of did the right thing, but then you kind of didn't do the right thing. You kind of negated what you did because you sent that text. And, you know, he said, well, I was angry. And so remember when we talked in class about how when you're angry or when you're upset or emotional, if you don't want to use your technology, and he went, uh huh, you know, he remembered that conversation. And so what it really these having these conversations at the end of the year really helps have a frame of reference, a common frame of reference, so that all of us in, have had in the you know, the entire ninth grade have had these conversations. And so it's very easy and very quick to really have a kid realize what they did was wrong and why that what they did was wrong because there's context there. And so um and so, you know, it it it, it luckily the resolve itself, you know, they actually apologized to each other without you know, the kid came back to me later and said, Oh, we worked it out in the church. But um but you know, it, for this student in particular, he's been struggling with, with how he uses social media and how he uses his phone since he before he even came to us and he was in eighth grade. And um there was another incident earlier in the year and it was just, it's just so easy to have these conversations because, um, you know, it's not easy because it's never easy to, to talk about when a kid screws up, but at least there's context there um, for those conversations. Um, so, you know, we really allow kids a lot of, of freedom. Um, and so with that freedom is a lot of responsibility. And that's something that we really try to start right day one, um, week one with, um, with the kids. And so, um, you know, something else just, you know, on the left-hand side, you'll see um, that's another example. This was, I think these kids were in, um, it might have been lunchtime or it might have been math class because the math class was right there on the left-hand side. Yeah, so that's just, you know, we have tables out in the hallway. The kids kind of sit there and hang out um, and work. Um, just, I just felt like I can just show you the culture of kind of um, 
how what I do in the classroom plays into the culture that we have. Um, and then on the right hand side, that was actually we did um, our, the hour of code. And so that was everybody doing the hour of code. Um, but that, um, you know, that, to, that looked very similar to the little kindergarten image that you saw in my elementary classroom. And so it was kind of amazing to me how I could learn about teaching high school from teaching kindergarten. <laughs> Um, and so a lot of some of the classroom management and some of the, um, the, the, the approaches that I use actually came from teaching kindergarten. Obviously, I don't teach them on a kindergarten level, but things like, you know, I expect that when I'm talking or when we're having a class discussion that your computer's closed. You don't have it open. Your phone's not out. You know, you can see there's phones in the picture. We don't take phones. We don't lock phones up. We don't, I do take phones, but it, you'd have, basically three strikes, you're out. You know, I talk to you once. Um, and that I have to talk to you, but the third time I have to talk to you about your phone, like your phone's coming up front with me. Um, but I explain to them why why I do that. It's not like I'm just taking your phone. It's like we're having a class discussion. It's really rude to be looking at a screen when someone's trying to talk to you. And so, um, you know, and so the uh, you know the, the I think it's really important as you know, as teachers that we don't just put these rules in place without under so kids really understanding why. Um, so that's that's kind of how um, that's oh I have 45 degrees hands on these um, and so that's really why I uh, you know that's, these pictures I hope kind of help show that that freedom that we give kids but that um, it does work if you are really explicit to the kids about what the expectations are and what um, you know what what their responsibilities are. Obviously, you know I I picked pictures that you know exemplify the perfect you know, what this looks like on a, a perfect day. Um, we do have, you know, we've had, we had a kid uh, get up from his computer, another kid get on the kid's computer and go to a porn site, you know. Um, we've had stuff like that happen. It's not like that stuff doesn't happen. But when we sat the two kids down, there was no argument. They knew what they did was wrong. They knew why what they did was wrong. They knew what the rules were. And so it was very easy to move forward with consequences, um, you know. So, um, it's just really about building that culture, um, uh, and I, you know, I see I'm running out of time. I'm sorry, if I, my internet went out. Um, but so just to show you, like, there's other stuff that goes on in our school that is tech related that's really fun. That on the left hand side is the our MakerBot, which I got through a Donors Choose um, Donors Choose project. That's an example of what happens when you leave something overnight to print and you don't check on it. Yes, 3D fail. <laughs> And so it was a really great experience for the kid to realize that there were gaps in their design and that that's why um, the printer didn't work. Um, and so, my son's getting restless. Um, and so, um, you yeah, know, just to kind of, uh, I, I like that picture because it just kind of shows, you know, the learning process. On the right hand side, um, we have a maker space there in the middle of the building. And so, a couple weeks ago, the, um, the teacher, the teachers actually learned from the kids. So the kids who've been working in the makerspace, they, uh, the kids who've been working in the makerspace taught us how to use the makerspace. So um, Liz there in the red shoes and the jeans, she and I, she's a student, um, she and I actually um, learned how to use the table saw at the same time. So I learned and then I had to, uh, I had to teach her how. And so it was kind of neat to like learn side by side with the kids. Um, and so I see a question about the learning process for students to make the adjustment to one-to-one -one access. Um, it is, um, and you know, having a lot of freedom is a blessing and a curse. And so, um, you know, some of our kids, um, and our kids have different levels of computer literacy too. That's something to think about. You know, when you're when you're going one-to-one, -one, you know, our kids come from very diverse backgrounds. Some kids come from middle-class backgrounds. Some kids come from you know, really low-income backgrounds, and so they have different access. Um, and so um, the, uh, you know, and then also the kids, it's like, okay, I've got this amazing tool in front of me. It's really awesome for doing my classwork, and it's also really awesome for getting really distracted when I'm supposed to be doing my work. And so we do have kids, we've had times where we've had to say to kids that you actually don't get to use your laptop for like a couple of days because it's more of a distraction than a help. Um, so um, I did. I just wanted to show you those, just kind of some other stuff going on in our school. And my son's like losing his mind right now, so um, hopefully he doesn't pull my headphones out. 
So basically, just kind of comparing and contrasting will be really quick because I see you're running out of time. Um, you know, elementary school was more guided. Like, I really had more structure to everything. Um, I had much less time to work with. Some classes only got me 45 minutes a week, so it was really hard to really have a, have a continuous learning experience with them. The really big thing, difference between elementary and high school, is that most tools required a teacher account because the kids were under 13, and so they couldn't... Um, you know, it was really hard to use often tools with them because I would either have to sign up for a teacher account and then import all of their names and then you know create accounts for them, or I couldn't do anything with it, or I had to pay money, and so it was really um, really limiting. You know what's great about GAF, um, you know, is that the kids just hit log in with Google, and boom, they're in, um, and they don't have to. And that was the other thing. Password management in elementary school is a nightmare because you know, I actually had every kid had an index card. On their index card, they had to write down all their passwords, and then they, um, and then I would give out, um, I would give out the index cards, you know, it's, it's during class, so that they could, you know, and I would put them. Some of the younger grades had to put them in different colors, so they would know well, the red one is for this website, and the green one is for this website. So, um, you know, and and uh, it's just so much easier with the the um, the Google, you know, sync up, um, and then. Um, and just the lessons are more easily applied to other classes in high school because what I'm teaching can be applied um, because they take their computers to their classrooms, whereas in elementary school, you know, it's like once they left the lab, they didn't have access to this stuff outside in their classroom, so it was a little bit more disconnected. Um, and so, um, you know, basically my reflection on all this, because I did actually do a lot of reflection while creating this slideshow, um, is that Everything I've been doing in elementary school for the, for the last however many years, like I guess um, six or seven years, um, has really come together and, and helped inform how I've been doing high school. Um, oh, honey, I know. She's losing it. Um, and so that's just kind of like my reflection was that it was pretty amazing to see how much I actually learned from elementary and was able to apply to high school. Um, so. Basically, that is it, um, and that's my contact information. And then I know, um, I know some people may have questions. I'm gonna do my best. Um, my son is really starting to lose his mind, so um, I will do my best to try to answer some. But let me turn off my mic. Okay, Mary Beth, I'll go look at the ones I've gathered. This one goes back to the first computer lab image. I think somebody asked, was this Alliance? Oh, yes, that was, yeah, Maureen was asking. Yeah, that, that was my, um, I worked at a charter school for three, three years. Um, Alliance mm -hmm. for Progress was the name of the school. So yeah, that was, okay. that was the name of the school. OK. Um, <laughs> How did you use the Apple Remote Desktop? Um, so I think I answered that. Um, I mean, basically, just uh, the locking of the screen, the um, ability to project mm -hmm. my screen onto their screen, um, and then also the ability, if I needed to, to take a screenshot of what a kid was doing in case they were like really doing um, something they shouldn't have been doing on the mm -hmm. computer. OK. I'm not sure if the question came after you addressed yeah, that or before. Either, so. um, um, and I can talk to Peggy's question about charter schools and like traditional okay. schools. Um, the uh, you know the um, I actually had I I did actually use a lot of my own curriculum stuff in the district school as well um, because again the, the district curriculum was was in my mind did not include enough of the web 2.0 and it was it was based around you know presenta like soft like uh, office tools and things like that um, but the um, you know the the one difference that was nice was that um, with the charter school, I just had more freedom as to the kinds of tech that we could get because you weren't bound by vendors and like the ordering process was easier and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but uh, but you know, the, and then the, with the district 
there were a couple times where we did like online benchmark testing and since my school only had a computer lab and we didn't have any other computers, they literally would shut down my computer lab for two weeks and I would help basically uh, monitor and, and, and facilitate the, um, the benchmark testing. So that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, there was commenting while you had been dropped about um, testing in the computer lab taking over. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Does SLA provide online access for kids who may not have it at home? That is not a physical computer, but the access. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I actually presented at um, a conference a couple weeks ago about our one-to-one -one program, and somebody asked mm -hmm. that same question. We don't. Um, we, we don't have the funds to to sponsor or subsidize kids' access. But here in Chile, sure. we have um, Comcast is our you know monopoly. <laughs> We've been way what Comcast mm -hmm. and Verizon, um, and so Comcast offers a. Um, it's like ten ninety nine a month or nine ninety nine a month. It's called Internet Essentials, and so if you're a low income, if you, if you, I think it's if you get uh, free reduced lunch, mm -hmm. then you qualify for um, that price. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty good deal. Um, of course, the only issue is that uh, if you have it, if you owe Comcast any money, you can't get that program, and so obviously a lot of people don't, might owe them money. Um, mm -hmm. But then. Uh, the other thing we do is, I mean, we have free Wi-Fi at the school, our school, but we have kids who come in at 7 o'clock in the morning to use our Wi-Fi and get their work done. We have kids mm -hmm. who stay till 6 o'clock at night to use the Wi-Fi and get their work done. Um, mm -hmm. We have kids who um, go to a family member's house on the weekend. And then the other piece to it is, you know, once these kids leave us, when they're, you know, wherever they decide, whatever, wherever they end up after their senior year, Maybe they won't have money for internet access. They need to figure it out. So they need to right. also learn how do I get access? You know, I can't depend it always depend on the school. I can't always depend on somebody to provide this for me. You know, how can I be empowered to figure out how I'm going to get access when I don't have it at home? Um, which is mm -hmm. a little, you know, might be a little bit like it sounds tough, but it's a really, really important um, because our kids our, our kids are gonna once they leave us, we can't really help them anymore. Right. Mm. Uh, somebody asked about um, accidental damage policy or warranty on the sure. Chromebooks. Um, do students pay an insurance fee or a tech fee? Yes. Uh, we have insurance fee that the kids pay. It's good for two years. It covers um, Loss or theft. I mean, it's not loss. It's because um, theft, mm -hmm. and so they get a police report. We file the police report. They get a new machine. Um, so you know, with no cost to them, and then they pay a deductible towards any damage. And so okay. um, they and they don't get their um, they don't get their uh, like we give them a loaner machine while their machine's getting fixed, but we don't give them the loaner mm -hmm. until we've had, until the deductible is paid. And then if a kid has a busted machine and they turn it in at the end of the year. They don't get their machine back until they've paid for the to, for it to be fixed. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So we do, yeah, we do have those kind of policies. Mm -hmm. Also, the the 3D fail picture you showed mm -hmm. is it expensive to have that 3D printer not print correctly? Actually, it's not that bad. The filament that we use and the plastic that's used, they, it comes in spools, and there is a mm -hmm. website, and of course I can't remember it now. Um, it starts with a Z, I can't remember. But they, if you're an educator, you just sign up as an educator, and they confirm that you really are who you say you are, and then you mm -hmm. can get spools for $15. Oh, so okay. it really isn't, I mean, it is, what really sucks is it's, it's the time that's lost, not right. the, the, right. the materials. Right, right, yeah, because it takes quite a while yeah. for that to So if create, that messes yeah. up and then the kid's got to do it all over again, then you've got mm -hmm. another, you know, hour or two, maybe three hours. Yeah, a big chunk of time mm -hmm. that's lost, yeah. Those seem to be the questions that I caught that you didn't ask as we went along. Okay. So I think we've, we're caught up now. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. for uh, Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I'm sorry again that, that we got dropped. Um, but I'm glad I was able to mm -hmm. make it back in.
All right, I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will do the upcoming shows for us. I know we're running over time, but that was so worth it. Thank you so much, Mary Beth, for hanging in there with us. And I think Noah was awesome. So we really appreciate you sharing with us today. We have a great show coming up next Saturday. Tammy Moore is going to share some fantastic student study tools with all of us. And the following week, we're having a great show with a, a team of five librarians who are going to be sharing how they use live binders to work with the teachers in their schools. And I know that the tips will work for anyone, not just librarians. The following week, we have Ava Robinson as our featured teacher. And she is doing fantastic things with TAC. So if you haven't discovered TAC yet, you'll be able to learn about it in that show. But she's creating some awesome kinds of tech tutorials for teachers that are really good. And she's creating them using TAC. So we'll get to see the things she's doing as well as the tools she's using. Do notice that we won't have a show on April 4th because that's Easter weekend in the United States. Following that, we're going to have a great presentation with Kyle Schutt. Shet, who is from Discovery Education, and he's going to tell us all about some of their amazing virtual field trips and the many free resources that are available to all of us through DEN. And then April 18th, if you know that thing link, you are going to want to come and hear from the guru of all times. Susan Oxnavad is going to be with us to share all about thing link and the amazing things you and your students can do with it. And then finally, April 25th, one more day where we won't have a show because that's the day of the DEN Spring Virtual Conference, and many of us love to go to that. So we'll look forward to having you all join us for any of those shows that you can make. Thanks, Peggy. Whoops, went too far. Uh, the Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's newest venture. He has gathered together all of his PD resources in one place, including bringing back the Host Your Own Webinar series. You can host your own event in a Blackboard Collaborate room. As long as you make the session public, it's free. You, you have no cost in a Blackboard Collaborate room for your webinar. You can nominate a featured teacher by using the form at this URL, tinyurl.com slash cr20live featured teacher nominate without the E at the end. And we have a featured teacher, such as Mary Beth today, once a month to um, have as a show guest. When you exit the room, your browser should open the CR the Classroom 2.0 Live survey, uh, you can get to the survey by the direct tinyurl.com link. You can also follow the link in the chat box. It's also in the Live Binder in that Resources tab that I pointed out at the beginning. And when you click on the survey, one of the things that you can request is at the bottom, you can ask for a professional development certificate. It works out much better if you request this soon after the live show. That's because they're bulk produced. They're, bulk, they're sent out in bulk. And your name gets printed on the certificate. It takes longer to get it if you wait before you submit the request. And the request fields are at the bottom of the survey. Please use a personal email account rather than a school email account to receive your certificate. Schools tend to block you from getting this email back. The video collection and audio collection are both on iTunes U, so you can watch or listen to recordings on the go. 
You can also access show archives with an RSS feed link on the website. So there are many different ways to get access to the recordings. Again, special thanks to Mary Beth Hertz, our special guest today, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing our website, to Blackboard Collaborate for, for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you so much for coming.